I would like to introduce or to uh, welcome everybody to Medicine Grand Rounds for this week. Um, today, we really have a very special guest, and so I'm very excited to um, introduce uh, Dr. Robert Wachter. Dr. Wachter is professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF, where he's the Holly Smith Distinguished Professor in Science and Medicine and the Benioff Endowed Chair in Hospital Medicine. He completed medical school at UPenn and his residency and chief residency at UCSF, where the, he has then become a lifer. He first coined the term hospitalist in 1996 and is often considered the father of the hospitalist field, the fastest growing medical specialty in US history. He's a past president, of course, then of the Society of Hospital Medicine and past chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine and has authored more than 300 articles and six books. Two of those books have been on safety and quality, including Understanding Patient Safety, which is the world's top selling safety primer. And his book in 2015 that has got a lot of attention, The Digital Doctor, Hope, Hype, and Harm at the Dawn of Medicine's Computer Age, which was a bestseller on the New York Times list. He has received several honors for his work. In 2004, he received the John Eisenberg Award, the nation's top honor in patient safety. And Modern Healthcare Magazine has ranked him as one of the 50 most influential physician executives in the US 13 times. Uh, in 2015, he was number one. In 2016, he chaired a Blue Ribbon Commission advising England's National Health Service on its digital strategy. He is a master of the ACP and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. During the pandemic, his tweets on COVID-19 were viewed more than 150 million times by more than 165,000 followers, of which I am one. And uh, in fact, that, that uh, number of followers exceeds our superstars here at Emory who are well known to you guys. He has served then as a trusted source of information on clinical public health and policy issues about the pandemic and currently is the interim host of the COVID-19 podcast in the bubble. However, I asked him to not talk about COVID-19 today because I uh, sense a little bit of fatigue about this topic. Um, and so instead to hearken back to pre-pandemic days, um, the topic that I think um, uh, uh, involved, uh, that he was most involved with and talking about most, which is healthcare's, the title of his talk, which is healthcare's digital revolution, finally a time for optimism. And I am really anxious to hear about a time for optimism, both in the context of the digital healthcare world and also just in general, given the pandemic and where we are now. So um, thank you so much for joining us for Medicine Grand Rounds, and I really look forward to hearing your discussion. As thank always, um, please go ahead and put um, questions in the chat, and I will moderate those at the end. So turning it over to you, Dr. Wachter. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. It's a pleasure to be here. You reminded me that I interviewed you for residency a little while back, and I was pleased to hear that I didn't make you cry or say anything obnoxious, so that, that was nice. Uh, it's great to see. I see a lot of familiar faces and names in the Zoom. Uh, sad to do it this way. I'm hoping, my greatest hope that is I'm not terrible and you'll actually invite me to come in person because my older son and daughter-in-law live in Atlanta and I'll actually tell you a little tiny bit about him a little later. Um, so I'd love to come and visit at some point, but we'll do it this way for now. And uh, as we're all muddling through. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen. Uh, and shockingly, Zoom does not yet have a feature that tells you for sure that your, your slides are showing. So I'm looking at Wendy and see if, if she gives me a thumbs up that the slides so are there. I see your slides, but they're not in presentation mode. All right, and how about now? Perfect. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to not talk about COVID. I, I couldn't resist completely not uh, not talking about COVID. So you'll you'll see there's a little bit in here about how COVID has advanced this agenda. But I think by and large, um, what I'll be talking about is a mega trend in healthcare, something that was happening before, uh, probably got accelerated a little bit uh, by COVID, uh, but uh, is happening after. And I think will be the dominant issue for uh, healthcare systems and for those of us in healthcare, probably for the next uh, 20 years and maybe forever. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. These days I always uh, wanna check in with people and be sure they're doing okay. And uh, I do that with the Fauci scale. Uh, this is five pictures of Tony's face uh, during uh, various moments of last year. And there were times where I was a Fauci 4.5, um, uh, but now I'd say I am a, uh, let's see if we can get this to advance. I'm about a Fauci 1.5, and this is largely COVID related. I think we're actually in a good place. 
Um, everybody understands sort of the, the, the vaccine versus variants race that we're in now, but a lot of the news coming out is quite good. And I think the, uh, it's great to see the resurrection of the CDC as a trusted uh, world-class organization. A lot of things are going well, and I actually am quite optimistic that we're, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So um, let's let's toggle to uh, digital healthcare and 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 where we are and where we're going. Uh, I took a year of my life in 2014-15 and 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 uh, did research to write a book about digital healthcare, and I wrote it because I was so disappointed by what I had seen in the first five or ten years of what I thought was going to be the digital revolution in healthcare. I'd been looking forward to. Uh, computerization of healthcare, like every other major industry, uh, coming and it came, and you'll hear in a few minutes sort of the sources of my disappointment. Uh, but one of the things that I thought about digital healthcare was that it was all about, or largely about, the electronic health record. So I've said said a lot of stupid things to mentees over the course of my career, um, but this is probably the stupidest. This is Russ Cucina, who is our chief medical information officer, and I hired him probably about 13, 14 years ago. And it was about at the point where we had started with a kind of starter electronic health record. We were about to ditch it and, and a few years later would go with Epic. And I thought that was gonna be a big job for him. He was gonna sort of lead that uh, installation of this massive enterprise digital system. And I thought there'd probably be several years of cleanup after that uh, and maybe updates and things like that. But I really did say to him, what will you do after we're done implementing the electronic health record. I, that was my conception of his job was to get that thing in and working. And after that was done, I actually wasn't sure that he would have employment. So that was really dumb. And I'll tell you about why and why we're entering the post electronic health record era and why that is uh, one of the main sources of optimism for me. Let's take a step back and just reflect on the fact that, that, that we are uh, completing an era that is actually extraordinarily important in healthcare. This is a slide that shows the electronic health record adoption in acute care hospitals in the United States from 20, uh, 2008 to 2017. And you see uh, here, it's sort of, anytime we say a curve like this these days, we think it's a COVID case curve, but this is the EHR adoption. And, uh, uh, and you see, here's a memorable number. So there's a little bit of extra data here, but take this away. In 2008, fewer than one in 10 hospitals in the United States had an electronic health record. A decade later, later, fewer than one in 10 did not. So in the space of a decade, we went from basically, if you think about healthcare, it's an industry that's all about data, data and analyzing data, collecting data, uh, reading data in journals, interpreting it, applying it to improve the health of people. Uh, so we went from an industry whose way of collecting data and moving it around was the piece of paper and the three ring binder. And you know we were the greatest buyers of fax machines and periodically we used the post-it note to an industry whose, elect whose backbone was entirely electronic. That is a very, very big deal. And uh, how did it happen that that spike there is kind of interesting. You see that something happened around 2009-10 that made everybody purchase an electronic health record. And it was when the federal government, interestingly, as we think about the soon passage of this uh, stimulus package um, and recovery package. It was when the federal government did a version of the same. Uh, the economy imploded in 2008, as you'll recall, uh, $700 billion, which seemed like a lot of money at the time, uh, doesn't anymore, uh, was applied to, uh, to saving the economy. If you were around at the time, you may remember the mantra was spend that money on shovel ready projects. And mostly they seem to be talking about building roads and bridges. Uh, but there were some smart health policy types in the White House who said, here is our one chance to dive into this money pile of $700 billion. And they came out with their fists full of 30 billion of them. Those 30 billion were used to incentivize hospitals and doctors to implement electronic health records. It's not that the money paid for the whole thing, but it was clear that here's, here's your chance to get some support to do this from the government. And a few years after the support's not only gonna go away, but you're gonna start getting penalized if you don't have one. And so everybody said, all right, now, <clears throat> now is our time to do that. And for most big health systems and most hospitals and doctor's offices, this was the time that they computerized. So as I said, I was very excited about this. Obviously, the rest of our lives have been computerized. And we think about the way we make plane reservations or restaurant reservations or plan our travel or, or manage our finances. It's all been computerized. And 
you know, we can quibble about, is it net good or net bad? Certainly some of the social media stuff, uh, you can make both arguments. But in terms of sort of the ease of how we get things done, it seemed pretty great. You know, I think my iPhone's pretty wonderful. And so I was a little naively uh, believing like this uh, gentleman, uh, what could go wrong? We're, we're, we're digitizing healthcare, thinking about the number of cases I'd seen of medical mistakes where it was because someone couldn't read the doctor's handwriting or uh, you know, the, the, you know, the results of the mammogram were in place A and didn't make place B or chest x-ray. You know, we can all think of hundreds of examples of things that went wrong because of uh, uh, using pen and paper. It just It's not a good way to, uh, to collect data, move it around, analyze it. So that was my kind of naive optimism about how, how wonderful the digital revolution was going to be. Now, I wrote a 300-page book about why things went wrong, so I, uh, it's kind of tough to summarize it in three minutes, but let me give you a kind of a few examples of things that did not go right. There are many of them. This is one. This is the one that's probably the most poignant. This is a seven-year-old girl um, visited her physician, her pediatrician, several years ago and drew, she's a, something of an artist, she drew a crayon uh, drawing that was her recollection of her visit to the doctor. I think it's a pretty nice drawing, but it's also pretty uh, horrifying because uh, later published in JAMA, you see the girl sitting on the exam table, mom next to her sister in the corner, and there in the other corner, typing away back to the patient is the physician whose main job at this moment appears to be feeding the computer as opposed to paying any attention to the patient or the patient's family. Now, the drawing, I think, is wonderful. Uh, uh, she only got one thing wrong. I don't know if you notice it. Uh, if, if you don't, it's the smile on the doctor's face because I know of uh, precisely no physician who is happy about this state of affairs that, 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 uh, that we've all turned into uh, glorified data entry clerks, uh, spending much of our time feeding the computer rather than uh, making eye contact with our patients. Uh, the only solution that anybody's come up uh, for this, of course, is the advent of scribes. Uh, scribes are brought to national attention in part by my wife who writes for the New York Times and she wrote an article on scribes, I think in 2016. And it was because I came home one day and told her about that, you know, a lot of health systems and doctors are hiring scribes to basically feed the computer. And I said, uh, I, you know, I said, every other industry digitizes and immediately starts laying people off. Only in healthcare could we figure out a way of digitizing and adding a third person to the exam room. But that's what has happened at UCSF. We now employ a ton of scribes, mostly virtual scribes these days. But uh, that was the only thing we found that sort of brought physicians uh, back to a position where they could make eye contact. So this clearly, I don't think, I, I didn't anticipate this. I don't know anyone who really did. And here's another sort of bit of evidence that things didn't go exactly as we had planned and hoped. This was an ad I found for an emergency medicine job in the state of Arizona. It begins innocently enough, Arizona General Hospital is coming to the Grand Canyon State. It's a 40,000 square foot boutique uh, general hospital. Uh, you know, when I think of general hospitals, I think of Grady, I think of uh, uh, San Francisco General, I don't think of boutique as a modifier, but uh, there you go. It's a little tiny uh, community general hospital. And here's the ad. Remember, they're advertising for an ER doc, so they say we have an ER, so that's good. Uh, radiology suite with some of the latest toys, a little tiny place, two ORs, outpatient surgery, 16 inpatient rooms, but there was only one part of the ad in bold. Clearly, they thought this was their main selling point. Uh, in the ad, it said, we have no electronic medical record. This was their way of, uh, of getting a doctor excited to practice there. You do not have to use one of those nasty electronic health records. So clearly things had gone wrong. It had gotten in the way of collegiality. It had gotten in the way of us making eye contact with our patients. Uh, we spend inordinate amounts of time feeding it, getting very little useful information back out of it. The systems were clunky. Uh, not particularly user-friendly, not particularly intuitive. So that was kind of the state of affairs, and it led me <clears throat> to, to really think hard about what had gone wrong. And as I said, I spent a year researching it, interviewing over 100 people from the CEOs of tech, of health tech companies and other tech companies, spent a day at Boeing, uh, learning how they did cockpit computer design, uh, talked to doctors, nurses, uh, several different countries. And so let me just distill some of the key lessons and the lessons actually are a source of my optimism because I came to believe that part of the problem is we're pretty early in this journey. It doesn't feel that way, but, but, but that's the way I think it's going to play out. And at the end of my book about this, I have a chapter where I kind of uh, 
I painted an optimistic picture. And I had some people say to me, you know, who, who was your ghostwriter for that? Because the rest of the book is so grumpy. And, uh, and the answer was, no, I, I actually see why this is going to work out. It's just early and it's clearly not working out yet. So here are some of the lessons that I've learned. And some of them, these come from other industries and the lessons because healthcare is so late to the digital ball. I think there's a lot we can learn as we look at how under, other industries have evolved and transformed themselves with IT. So here are the four stages that I think every industry goes through when they digitize. The first is you have to begin by digitizing the record. You have to begin by taking all of your paper out and getting however you, whatever data you're storing and using, financial data, uh, uh, you know, travel information, uh, manufacturing information, whatever it is, you have to get it in digital form. The second, which is inevitably a problem, is all of the parts connect because in the beginning, there's, has, there's almost always multiple ways that one gets it into digital form, multiple systems, and they don't talk to each other, and that's a problem. So this is known in the world uh, of, 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 of digital as interoperability, the connection of all the parts. And in the healthcare version of it, it has two components. I'd say a few years ago, the biggie was, was enterprise systems, the electronic health record in a PCP's office connecting to the one in the hospital, your Epic system connecting to a hospital that refers to you that happens to use Cerner, those sort of things. I think increasingly important is what I have here under B, which is third party apps, new tools that are developed to solve specific clinical and business problems. Uh, or patient facing systems. Patients increasingly are doing a lot of their work, including clinical work uh, on their phones, on their computers. How do you get those systems also to connect to your Epic or your Cerner system? So connecting all the parts together is a very big and important stage in the digital transformation of any, any industry. Now, those two things are good because they get your data in digital form and they get it flowing. But where you really see benefits from digitization is when you take all of this digital data that's now sloshing through your tubes and you glean meaningful insights from it. You analyze it and you say, oh, now I see here's a better way of taking care of a patient with sepsis or predicting who's going to have a bad outcome with a given disease or trying to figure out what the best treatment for this or that is or how to manage our flow in through the ER or the, o or the operating rooms. Uh, this is a really important stage. And I would posit we do almost none of this in healthcare yet, although we're starting to get a little bit better. And the fourth, of course, is where the money is, which is converting these insights into actions that improve value. Action can be everything from use of other digital tools to changing our workflow or our workforce or our incentive system or enabling patients to do things that it used to take a provider to do or enabling a less expensive provider to do something that it used to take a more expensive provider to do. Those are improved healthcare value, quality, safety, access, equity, divided by cost. Here's my scorecard for healthcare. Uh, yes, we have digitized the record. That was that, that adoption curve I showed you. We've begun to do some of this. Uh, we have Epic at UCSF. I'm guessing you probably do too. Epic to Epic is pretty good these days. Epic to Cerner is pretty terrible. Uh, Epic to almost anything is pretty terrible. And when there's a third party app that we have used and liked as a better way of taking care of people with, you name the disease, and we go to our IT people say, we want to integrate this into our Epic system. You see them uh, shaking their head and saying, no, 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 we can't do that. It's going to take 100 hours of programmer time. There's a huge amount of friction. It, it is anything but the app store where you can plug and play. And so uh, we made some progress here, but not nearly enough. I think we've done almost none of this, and we've done almost none of this. Now, I mentioned my son who lives in Atlanta. Um, periodically, I'll get into, him with, get into it with him because he's in another industry that uh, is important, so is healthcare. And he will say to me something like, you know, you know it must be our industry is more important because we do all four of these things. We've invested in it. Um, he spends a lot of his time on numbers three and four, taking all the data that they have about uh, their entire business and trying to make sense of it and then giving it to people who can then implement it in ways that improve the value of what they do. And I, I kind of lost the argument because it obviously his industry is more important than ours is because he works for the Atlanta Braves uh, doing Moneyball. There he is at their spring training down in Florida. Um, and he, they, have, they can do all four of these things. They've done it for years. If you think about Moneyball, that's what it was about. 
It was, it was recognizing that when you get down to number three and four, you can actually improve the performance tremendously. And he'll tell me periodically about the stuff that they can do. They can tell you that this guy can't hit a low and outside curveball on Tuesday nights when the wind is out of the Southwest and the pitcher is over six foot two. And he says, what can you do? And I said, well, with these, we have these sepsis alerts, but they're wrong about 30% of the time. You know, it's clearly they are a decade ahead of us in their ability to take all of the digital data they collect and glean insights into it and convert that into ways that improve uh, their performance. Um, I think we're gonna get there, but we are very early. They started a decade or two before we did. And I think the analogy of financial services and, and uh, other industries is, is, is real. All those industries do all four of these things. So that actually gives me hope because I think we're on the path there. It's just a slow path. Second thing that kind of gave me some, uh, uh, some confidence about this comes from uh, the work of Eric Brynjolfsson uh, when he was at MIT, he's now at Stanford. Eric coined the term, the productivity paradox of IT. He did that in 1993 and he did it because he analyzed uh, industries that digitize. And inevitably it, 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 they digitize with a huge amount of hype. It's gonna be wonderful. It's gonna be transformative. Everything's gonna be great. It's gonna improve, improve productivity. And they put in the computers and lo and behold, not much would happen. And they'd all be left shaking their heads saying, huh, I thought this was gonna be spectacular. That's what you told us. That's what the hype was. And it did not achieve the level of productivity improvements that had been promised. And so uh, I think it was captured nicely by this quote from uh, Robert, Robert Solow, a Nobel Prize winning economist. No, notice the year 1986. So he was commenting on what they saw in on the factory floor, on the Wall Street trading desks and industries that computerized early. And his quote is, you can see the computer age everywhere, except in the productivity statistics, meaning, you know, I walk into the factory floor, I walk into the trading desk, there's computers everywhere, but we're not seeing the promised gains in productivity. And the message of this research, Brynjolfsson and other people who analyze sort of digital businesses, is that the productivity paradox is real, it's, it's invariable, it always happens, and it lasts somewhere between five and 10 years, and then it gets better. In other words, then you begin seeing the promised advantages of computerization. It does not happen when you take the computer out of the, uh, out of the box and get rid of the shrink wrap. It takes a while. And uh, why does it take a while? Well, I've, I've made the analogy to a safe deposit box. There are two keys that have to be unlocked in order to uh, fix the productivity paradox. The first is the technology has to get better. Version 1.0 is always clunky in every industry. And if you look at Epic now versus Epic five years ago, it's substantially better, although it's still, I'd argue, pretty far behind the kind of tech technology we're used to in the rest of our lives. But interestingly, that was not the main key. The main key was a second one, and it was what Brynjolfsson and others called reimagining the work itself. In other words, the real key for the productivity improvements was that people needed to begin saying, why do we do it this way? And, and can we come up a different way of doing this work? Now, why didn't they do that on day one? Because humans aren't very imaginative. All they can think of doing when they computerize is just computerize the old paper processes. So why does the physician's note in, in Epic or CERN or whatever system you're using, why does the physician's note look like a piece of paper under a tab? Because it looked like a piece of paper under a tab when you had a chart, when you had a paper chart. And that's we just replicated that, made it digital, which makes a little bit, a few things better. I mean, you can see it in multiple places at the same time. That's cool. On the other hand, it's made a few things worse, like you can import uh, 200 pages of lab and, and x-ray results to make it impossible to find what you want to find. Uh, but if you were designing a physician's note today in a world of Google Docs or Wikipedia or collaborative uh, note writing or a world of Twitter or Facebook, which have, you know, uh, streams of data and interactive data and not just words, but pictures and audio all integrated. You probably design something like that. You wouldn't design something that looked like a piece of paper under a tab, but that is what we do. This is why it takes time because you basically need a new generation to come in that thinks digitally and begins asking the questions, why are we doing it this way? This makes no sense. And for folks like me who remember the old days, we say, oh, well, what other way could there be? And that's when things get better, when they say, well, let's think about doing this a completely different way. So a lot of my optimism really has to do with us coming to what I think will be the end of our productivity paradox phase. Um, now, as I said, most industries fix this in five to 10 years. Healthcare, I think, will take longer. 
I'd argue we're about 10 years into the widespread electronic health record use, and we certainly haven't fixed it yet. Why will healthcare take longer? It's harder. It's more dispersed. Uh, the stakes are higher. You know, I live in Silicon Valley. They talk about fail fast. That's fine with a restaurant app, but not so good if you kill somebody. Uh, highly regulated, HIPAA. Oh, you, you name it. I mean, you can name all the reasons. I'd also say doctors are better lobbyists than taxi cab drivers. And so it's a lot of forces that get in the way of, of digital transformation. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be 10 years. I think it's more like 15 or 20. But I do think we're entering a new and more hopeful phase. And part of it is, as I think about this, I think we're beginning to enter this post-electronic health record uh, era. Who won the derby to, to, to build your electronic health record. Well, the, the winners clearly are two big companies, Epic and Cerner. These are healthcare specific companies that were good at building electronic health record, which whose main job was to collect data and move it around. They were ready and poised when healthcare went digital. But if you think about their core skills, they knew nothing about consumer facing tools, building beautiful user interfaces, learning from data, communication, uh, visualization, um, now they're trying to build these competencies and they're doing some of that, but this is not what they were built to do. They were built to, 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 uh, to build an electronic health record, sell it to you, which they have done successfully. And interestingly, in the old, old days, the original entrance into the electronic health record world were companies like GE, IBM, uh, Google tried their hand at it. I was actually an advisor to Google Health in 2005, lasted a year, and then they took it down, saying it's too hard. Microsoft tried. All of these huge digital giants tried, and they all failed. Turned out to build an electronic health record, you had to do only that. And part of it because you had to really learn a lot about healthcare. But I think now, as we look at what we need our digital tools to do in the face of value pressure, the needs for population health, the needs to improve interoperability, the, the access to cloud computing, artificial intelligence. And I think the digital landscape, both the, the Googles and Apples and Microsofts of the world, but also the, the, uh, the startups and the venture capital that's investing in them have all matured. They understand how challenging healthcare is, that this is not as easy as building, uh, building an app for, for something in the consumer world. Uh, they understand they better be in this for the long haul. It's going to take some time, but they're they're all back in in a big way. I'll tell you about that in a second. And the electronic health records are trying to evolve to meet some of these needs. But if history is any judge, they won't be successful because it's not what they were built to do. And I think healthcare organizations, mine, yours, are starting to mature in their approach to digital transformation, taking advantage of their data, and beginning to reinvent the work. And I want to give you a few examples of, of things I've seen at my own place that give me a sense that we're beginning to be smarter, more clever about how we take advantage of digital tools to reinvent our work. So one example I like, and I like it partly because it's not all that digital. And you might even think about this and say, oh, that's what, what's digital about that? Well, the example is one in which it could not have happened if we didn't have the backbone of an electronic health record and a digital system. This is our inpatient glucose management service, is how it works. Uh, early in the morning, every day, sitting in his house, we have a diabetologist named Rob Rushikoff who reviews the data of every patient in our uh, inpatient setting who meets one of these four criteria, type one diabetes, insulin pump, two or more sugars pretty high, any sugar less than 60. Now, Rob, for the last 30 years, has been trying to get us to improve the care of people with diabetes in the hospital, and he has tried practice guidelines and education and CME and every which way, and none of them work very well. This way works. Now, notice the first thing that's digital. This could not have happened in paper world. The computer sifts through our 700 inpatients. Uh, uh, it takes a nanosecond for it to look for any patient meeting one of these four criteria. And on the average day, uh, about 20, 25, sometimes 30 patients meet those criteria. And it creates for him a queue, uh, basically one, one patient record after another of any, any per patient meeting one of these four criteria. Could not happen on paper. If you wanted to do that in paper world, you would have to be doing chart review uh, all day long. It couldn't do it in real time. So that's one thing the computer can do. And there is Rob looking at the data. And the second thing the computer can do that we couldn't have done in paper is we said to Rob, what do you need to see in order to, at a glance, figure out whether the team is managing the diabetes correctly? 
And he told us, he said, oh, I need to see the, you know, the glucose trend, insulin doses, oral hypoglycemic doses, ins and outs, a few basic labs, uh, diet. And so our IT people built this screen for him. It doesn't come out of the box from Epic. And I'm told it took several hours of programmer time. It wasn't a, a heavy lift. And so now at six in the morning, he can have his cafe latte in his house, sit down, and we have teed up for him the 20 or so patients meeting those criteria. And each one, he can toggle through a screen that looks like this and decide the team is managing the sugar just fine. I don't need to do anything. He doesn't do anything, just moves to the next one. Or in about eight or 10 patients a day, he will look at it and say, hmm, no, I don't think so. They should change this insulin dose or change this diet or change the ins and outs or whatever it is. And he writes a consult. So uh, it comes, it's a consult from the glucose management service. And I first learned about this about three or four years ago. I was ward attending and I said to my team, you know, did we hear back from the consultants? And they said, oh yeah, ID saw the patient dropped a note. Cardiology saw the patient hasn't written a note yet. And I started to walk away because those were the two consultants we called. And then the resident said to me, oh, and by the way, we got Russia coughed. So this had been turned into a verb. And uh, uh, the house staff, of course, uh, found it uh, amusing. Uh, the Rushikoff uh, recommendations were always terrific. That we always followed them. Uh, and now it's become a little bit of a parlor game as the house staff are writing initial uh, orders for patients with, uh, with diabetes. One of the things they sort of talk about is, uh, you know, I'm trying not to get Rushikoff. So it's sort of a badge of honor if you can bypass Rob looking at your, at your note and making recommendations to you. Uh, here's an article published a couple of years ago in the Annals showing that hyperglycemia fell by about 40%, hypoglycemia by about the same, uh, 40 severe hypoglycemic episodes before 15 after. And most interestingly, I think it takes, if we were to call Rob to say, we want you to do a consult, which of course we'd never do with, with a patient with diabetes who had poor control, unless it was you know, a huge outlier. But if we were to call him, it would take him an hour to do a full on consult, review the chart, talk to the patient, do the exam, come back, write the note, call the team, all that kind of stuff. It takes him about an hour a day to do what I just told you, to toggle through 20 patients and end up writing briefs, mostly templated with him then customizing it for the patient, uh, recommendations for on average six to 10 patients a day. So it's really scaling the expertise of the specialist by using digital tools. This is what I'm talking about in terms of reinventing the work. It's a way of thinking about delivering care, taking advantage of digital capabilities, but this is not writing massive amounts of code. It's not super duper artificial intelligence, although you can imagine AI Rushikoff uh, in some future iteration. And we are currently taking this and thinking, we, we call these TACOs, targeted automated consults, uh, and we're looking at other disease states use cases for this. We're doing hyponatremia now and a few others to see whether this, this kind of approach will improve, uh, improve quality uh, and, and, uh, and efficiency. I suspect it will. Another quick example of reinventing the work, and I think this is a durable impact of COVID, is dashboards. Again, what I've already told you is part of the challenge and part of the problem is we have all this digital information sloshing around through our digital tools. We take so little advantage of it. That's part of what makes clinicians so unhappy. They feel like they're spending all this time feeding the computer and getting so little useful intelligence out of it. Be, be like if all you did was feed your baby and the baby never smiled at you, it would, it would make you unhappy very quickly. So here's a, something that I think did tip during, uh, during COVID. It's, 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 it's dashboards. Uh, and these are, this is our COVID dashboard taken yesterday. And I think it's beautiful. And it, it, it's in one-stop shopping. I can take a look at it as I do every single day. And I can look in the bottom left and see our test positivity rate, which is down to 0.7, divided into both symptomatic versus asymptomatic patients. Asymptomatic, we test everybody, so asymptomatic might be a patient coming in for a cath, uh, where it's 0.4. I can look at the case curves and the hospitalizations and, and, and ICU patients in the upper right. I can look at it right in the middle, what we have today, what we've had over the course of the pandemic. One-stop shopping, beautifully laid out. Uh, visualize the kind of thing that other industries have gotten used to, uh, and you're used to when you you know you look at your bank account or Fidelity or <clears throat> go onto your favorite airlines. They, they all they all do stuff like this, but we've had none of this in healthcare. So I think that is going to be one of the enduring impacts of COVID. I think it has brought forth 
the idea of taking digital data and displaying it, whether it's, it's, it's disease curves or case positivity rates, in ways that are useful and actionable, both for clinicians and managers, something that I think is a really important uh, phase that we're now going to go through in, in digital transformation. I think another thing that has to happen is that we've got to reorganize ourselves in order to take advantage of digital uh, capabilities and tools. This is sort of what it's looking like at UCSF. We have our traditional arm, which we call health informatics. This is what I, that first slide I showed you, uh, Russ Kuchina, who runs this. And it's, it's the group that is sort of solving day-to-day -day problems. They built our EHR, they, they update it, they integrate it, they solve core business and clinical problems every day. Big, important, we have more affiliations like you do. Some of them we're putting our EHR into them. They do all of that. We have another group connected but distinct called the Center for Digital Health Innovation. And it really is a digital solution shop. Their job is to solve big, hairy problems with a longer time horizon where there's no single or simple solution. And there's probably not one tool, whether it's in Epic or whether we can buy something that solves the whole problem. It's gonna be something that's gonna require a whole bunch of different tools, maybe some of them from, uh, from startups, maybe some of them from the Googles and Amazons of the world, maybe some of them we have to build ourselves, maybe some of them do come from Epic that Epic is building. But these two things have to integrate because at the end of the day, if you have some wonderful new tool, but the, the physician has to log into a separate website, ain't going to work. You know that. It's got to be all integrated into one from the physician standpoint or clinician standpoint. has to feel like I'm still on Epic, even if you're no longer using an Epic built tool. And this is the big one that we're working on now. We call the digital patient experience. It is, it is building the set of tools that allow the patients to have the best, <clears throat> most optimal experience whether it's how they schedule their appointment, how we communicate with them, uh, as they increasingly have digital tools at home, sensors, surveys, how all that weaves together so it's not a mess. Big, complicated. If we left it to our EHR people, they'd never get to it because they're too busy doing their day-to-day -day work. It has to be a separate group that is sort of charged and budgeted to do this work, but has to be constantly integrated back into the EHR. So I think we didn't have this kind of integration a couple of years ago. We think this is the direction that every institution is going to have to go in uh, in order to get this kind of innovative, new, digital transformative work done. All right, a few final comments on kind of where we're going and, and, and why I'm optimistic, but there's still some work to be done. And one of them is this issue of interoperability. Here's the laying of the golden spike that connected the transcontinental the railroad. In the beginning, of course, there were two different railroads and they didn't connect. And that's kind of what we have in healthcare. And I mentioned that interoperability, when I thought about it five years ago, it was really Epic to Epic or Epic to Cerner, but increasingly it's not. It is all of these sources of digital data on our patients, whether it's their heart and rhythm on their watch or their uh, what they're asking about on Alexa, or other stuff they do in their smartphone or their genomics data, all this stuff they're doing outside the orbit of their healthcare organizations and certainly outside the orbit of Epic or Cerner. And eventually we have to lay the golden spike to weave all this together, making progress there, but still, uh, still not yet done. So I think we're, we're gonna make progress there. I think the movement to the post electronic health record era is exciting. I think the fact that organizations like mine, and I'm guessing yours are beginning to think about how they internally organize themselves to do this more transformative work as they move beyond the electronic health record. But one of the most exciting trends is that the digitization of healthcare in the form of the EHR paved the way for a lot of money and a lot of companies to recognize an opportunity in healthcare one that they didn't see before because if all the data were in paper charts, there's nothing they could do. As I said, I helped advise Google 15 years ago. Google tried it and got out because they said, there's nothing we can do until the data begins in digital form. Now it's all in digital form. Obviously not easy moving it around. Privacy, security, lots of issues come. But, but, industry, but, but venture capital, as you see here, uh, the size of the venture capital investment, and this does not include the amount of money that the Googles and Amazons and Apples and Microsofts are investing, a massive amount of investment to try to uh, digitally transform healthcare. And you see the digital giants, which as I said, tried to do healthcare a long time ago, mostly left uh, with their tails between their legs saying, this is too hard, they're all back in. It's not easy and some of them are failing again. I'll tell you about that in a sec. 
Watson Health, when Watson beat the Jeopardy champions, Watson, IBM said we can do healthcare next. So they made a big play there. Google has hired an all-star team of talent, um, in, uh, including David Feinberg, who uh, ran Geisinger, ran UCLA, uh, Karen DeSalvo, um, uh, Rob Califf, a former FDA commissioner. You know, it's sort of a, it's a, it really is a hall of fame of healthcare leaders uh, trying to help Google succeed this time. Microsoft is there. Apple is there. The big play was uh, Amazon, J.P. Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway got together three years ago and formed a company called Haven and hired Atul Gawande uh, away from Harvard to run it. Just to show how this is not easy, Haven closed uh, this year and Watson recently announced that it's for sale. So if you want a care AI company, you can go ahead and buy Watson for Health if you want. Uh, so not easy, not a slam dunk, but I do believe these other companies are going to have staying power. They understand how hard that is, uh, this is, and they're making the investment. A word about telemedicine. This is sort of the only COVID really, truly COVID related things. You know, everybody's curve was this 1%, 2% televisits up to 55, 70% enabled by fear. Patients didn't want to come in, doctors didn't want to come in. Uh, but uh, the relaxation of the barriers that are getting, getting in the way of telemedicine, including the regulatory barriers, the HIPAA barriers, and payment parity, all of those got fixed, at least temporarily, and led all of us to go up to, at most places, 70% telemedicine. It's coming back to earth now, more like, um, in most places, 20 to 25% telemedicine. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. A lot of it will depend on what happens with those payment and regulatory changes. My guess is that, that the environment will remain uh, positive for telemedicine. And I should say that I have a conflict here. I'm on the advisory board of the biggest company in this space called Teladoc. So just uh, take that, uh, consider that as I talk about telemedicine. Here's the fundamental question I think about uh, telemedicine and virtual visits. Is it simply a visit replacement? Is it simply a different way for the patient to see a doctor for a 15, 20 minute visit? That's fine. Patients seem to like it. Our, our patient satisfaction scores are higher for televisits than for in-person visits, probably because we charge so much for parking and the bridge tolls are so high. Uh, our providers seem to like it fine. Uh, probably maybe more importantly, it opens up the opportunity for non-geographically determined care options. So if you were the Mayo Clinic 20 years ago and you said, we want to be a national brand, you needed to buy or build buildings in Scottsdale, Arizona and in Florida and wherever else you wanted to be. But if you want to be a national brand in healthcare now, you can do it through telemedicine. Now you can't deliver a baby, you can't do surgery, but there's a lot of stuff that you can do virtually. So if it is simply a different way of seeing patients in a traditional way, that is a pretty big deal. And I think it's going to stick. I think telemedicine is going to be part of the landscape forever. But I don't think it's the biggest question. The biggest question is whether the, the tipping point for telemedicine paves the way for true virtual care, which I think is going to be the real game changer. And why might they be related? If the patient's no longer coming to the office to get their blood pressure checked or their weight or their glucose, how are you going to get those data? Well, they're going to check their blood pressure with their home digital cuff, and you're going to get it from them. And uh, if you're going to do that, why just get it once every three months? That's silly. Why don't you get their daily blood pressure? They're doing it virtually. They're standing on a digital scale. They're, sta they're checking their glucose a few times a day. These are digital data streams. Why don't we tap into them? And, and the measures are semi-continuous. <clears throat> but here's the billion dollar question that we're going to have to figure out the answer to, which is how are we going to manage these new data flows? And let me just show you what that looks like. Patient has their 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 uh, their digital watch, an Apple Watch. Let's say it's measuring their heart rate and their rhythm, and it is continuously sending off a signal that theoretically could go to the primary care doctor. And I've heard people give talks about this, and they say something like, "How wonderful is it going to be that if the primary care doctors can get all of this semi-continuous data on each of their sixteen hundred patients? That's going to be so great. They're going to be able to manage them so much better." And when I hear that, my BS detector goes wild because I can tell you that the 300 primary care doctors that work in my department, if I tell them this is going to happen, they'll, they'll quit by five o'clock today. I mean, this is simply not doable on the chassis of our existing healthcare system. We have to do something very different. Something very different is likely to be something like this that has been called the care traffic controllers, but it's going to be a new middle layer in the system that through some combination of people and artificial intelligence and bots is taking all that data, 
sifting through it to figure out what's a false positive and a false negative. Think about the ICU. But now the data is coming from less reliable tools in people's houses. Uh, sort out what to do with it, sort out uh, which to ignore, which to pay attention to, and then how to triage that. It's an enormous problem, but if it goes right to the doctor, uh, the system's gonna fall apart. What might that look like? Here's one patient, 112 sugar is high again. The algorithm bumped the insulin, but let's get the, the coach involved. So maybe not a doctor or an NP. Patient 42 has an irregular heart rate and is short of breath. Let's do a televisit, okay? And then in the world of the internet of things, maybe patient 13's weight is up and oxygen saturation's worse. I'll lock the salt shaker and the refrigerator. That's probably a few years down the road. But we're gonna have to figure this out as we move to this new era. And with, with um, this, here's, uh, here's a several predictions. Uh, several of them are easy and one is really hard. Here's the easy stuff. Health IT will ultimately transform and disrupt health and healthcare. I can say that with 100% certainty because every other industry where uh, IT has come in and matured has completely turned the industry upside down. And importantly for all of us, the leading entities at the beginning were not the leading entities at the end. And in many cases, uh, you know, think, think Kodak, think Blockbuster, uh, in many cases, uh, they were out of business. Now, will healthcare organizations be out of business? Probably still going to need places to, uh, with ICUs and to do surgeries and transplants, but there's a lot of stuff that we do that will be transformed and disrupted. The new system will be less institution-focused, less geographically determined, more patient-centric, and here's the optimistic part of me. I think at the end of the day, deliver higher quality, less expensive, and more equitable care. All of those can be can be argued with, and I'm sure there will be examples where that's not true. But I think that we will move toward a better system, although it's quite different than the one that we currently have. Who is going to win this battle? I think it can be any of these uh, these entities. I'm rooting for number one because I like my job. Existing healthcare organizations that thoughtfully embrace digital transformation. Some of the winners will be electronic health vendors that manage, innovate, and open their architecture, although many of them will fight that. Some of them will be the Amazons, Googles, Microsofts, Apples of the world that are somehow able to maintain a focus on health. That has always been a problem for them because they're, they're in every industry and health is harder than most other industries. So sometimes they, they try it for a while and they pop out, we'll see. And But I think there'll be a lot of winners among the fourth category, which is new companies that skillfully in, uh, address important use cases rather than trying to do everything, focus on can we figure out a better way of taking care of patients with heart failure, for example, or with diabetes. Uh, and, and there'll be winners and losers in all of these categories. Those are the easy predictions. The hard one is when this is going to happen. It's going to happen over the next 10 to 15 years, whether it's five years or 15, I think is, is a little bit hazy right now. So I'm in with this um, slide. This is Mel Chetlin, a wonderful senior, now retired uh, cardiologist at, at, at UCSF, a great clinician educator. We were at a meeting uh, several years ago. We were talking about transformation, including digital transformation and kind of the new world of healthcare. And I could see my senior faculty getting more and more depressed about you know, the, the end of the days of the giants and the golden era and how different this is and how hard it is. And then Mel got up at this faculty meeting and said something I'll never forget it. He grabbed the microphone, which he usually didn't do. And he said, you know, folks, he said, this could be worse. And I was a little surprised by that, seeing what he would say. Then he went on, he said, I could be younger. Now I tell you that because I found it amusing, uh, but also personally, I don't think it's true. I actually think that we're gonna enter an era that's gonna be quite exciting, although challenging and somewhat disruptive. But at the end, the integration of digital tools into what we do, I think will add value to the work that physicians do. I think there will be an important role for physicians. I think a lot of the stuff that we currently do that we don't need to do that others could do or digital could do. I think if we can figure out how to parse that, I think we can figure out a way of delivering better care, safer care, more equitable care, and do it at a much more affordable cost. So I'm actually quite enthusiastic about this, but there are gonna be a lot of bumps in the road. Let me stop there and I look forward to, uh, to taking any questions you have. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, that was fantastic. Um, I'm gonna start out by asking a question that um, I suspect you get asked a lot, which is, you know, you've described a lot of really exciting ways to use data um, and uh, informatics and so on to improve patient care. 
But there's a couple of other forces that really influence how we use the electronic medical record. And of course, they are billing CMS and insur the insurance industry and the bloat that happens to meet those goals. And then, you know, driving productivity rather than driving patient safety and quality and patient experience and so on. How do you see all of that getting reconciled? Because, uh, well, they'll just stop there. Um, I, it's hard to know. I mean, it can go in many different directions. And one of the things about healthcare is it's not only determined by what is best for the patient. It's there, there are a lot of entities that have their hands in the $4 trillion a year money jar. And to some extent, they will all fight changes uh, that disrupt their business model. And so, um, you know, that's politics 101. We'll have to see how that goes. As Warren Buffett calls healthcare the great tapeworm that steals money from other things, including the public health system, including um, you know poverty, including the schools, uh, you know the, the housing, all of these other things. I think this is one area that the right and the left agree on that the amount of money we spend on healthcare for the outcomes that we get are not what we want. So I think the 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 the, the arc here will trend toward enabling. Uh, disruption that allows for better outcomes at a lower cost. There will be entities that fight it as they do in every other, you know, think taxi cabs and Uber. There are entities, think stores and Amazon. Uh, there, are, there are industries that always have an interest in keeping it the way it is. Ultimately, the, uh, the new ways of doing things that provide consumers, and we hate to think about patients like that, but at some level they are, consumers with better uh, a better product at a lower cost are going to win. And the payers of, uh, of the bills um, are not going to tolerate the waste in the system. So th there's going to be disruption everywhere. Actually, I think healthcare providers are in an enviable position because, you know, I think the doctor is probably the last entity to get disrupted. The, you know, the, the insurance company, the middle companies in here, the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmacy benefits managers, there's so much waste as all of this stuff goes through this assembly line that, you know, the, the, the disintermediation here, I think will disrupt a lot of that. And, you know, policy will follow because we can't afford, business will not allow, taxpayers will not allow the amount of money that they're spending for the quality of the healthcare that they get. So, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be bumpy and there's going to be a huge amount of pushback. Um, Dr. Stevens, are you in a position to unmute and ask your question? Hi, Bob. Good to see you again. How Hello, are David, things? how are you? My, my, Good. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great uh, pleasure. We welcome you really to Atlanta anytime. Uh, we know about the Braves. and Yes. <laughs> um, I have really two questions. One was your comment about scribes and tell us a little bit more about how you're using scribes and are they working for you? And the other was about this digital health, uh, digital patient experience. And can you tell us more about that? What's it costing and, and what's it supposed to do in terms of, of patient interface? Sure. So Scribes, about three or four years ago, the health system decided to uh, invest in Scribes a few million dollars a year. And we're probably a five to $6 billion a year healthcare enterprise. So a few million dollars a year in hiring Scribes for our busiest outpatient clinicians. We did that after seeing net promoter score data that you know they were just unhappy in their work. And part of it was the amount of time they're spending on the computers. Um, I think it's been a terrific success. It has markedly increased the level of satisfaction among those providers. We're now at the inevitable stage where the healthcare system is saying, why are we paying 100% of the cost of this? It should be shared between the healthcare system and the department. And the department is then saying, should we pay for it or should the doctors themselves pay for it? There's no question that it improves, and this has been seen everywhere, it improves the satisfaction of the doctors. It probably improves care as well. Uh, the hope for trade-off was that it would also improve productivity, that they'd be able to see more patients. We've seen a little bit of that, but nowhere near enough to pay the cost. So this is a cost and we have to decide whether it's worth it. In the beginning, we had scribes that were in the office with the person. We're now using mostly virtual scribes, meaning that, that the, the, uh, the interaction is sometimes just audio, sometimes audio and visual, goes out to a remote person who then uh, transcribes the draft of the note the clinician always has to 
approve it. I, if I was investing, I would not invest in a uh, in-person scribe company because there are a lot of companies working on, on digital scribing. And I think what we will have within a few years is the doctor and the patient have a conversation. There is an Alexa-like device that picks that up and your note gets created from that conversation. That may sound easy, but it's not because it's not just voice recognition. It can't be a transcript. It has to take the note and turn it into, take the conversation, turn it into note. But I think that's going to happen. A lot of places working on it. In terms of digital patient experience, it is basically a very big, ambitious three or four year plan to transform the way people interact with us, uh, recognizing they're not going to tolerate waiting on hold. They're not going to tolerate in inability to self-schedule. They're not going to tolerate that they're now getting reminders from nine different places, which is confusing. It looks like we don't have our act together. Increasingly, they are going to be taking their blood pressure from home digitally, and we've got to figure out how that gets integrated. Um, ultimately, this is going to branch into a much more network air traffic control, which is a patient who's in a suburb. Do we sort of guide them? You should see one of our doctors in this place near your house rather than in, in, in the mothership in the city. Big and ambitious budgets in the many tens of millions of dollars. It's a multi-year budget, and it's basically saying to this group, here's the big ambition, figure it out while the people that run Epic day to day have their head down running Epic day to day. There's no way that they could do that with that complexity. You know, and part of the challenge is Epic will say, oh, and we're building this thing that you need, but they say that all the time and it's sometimes they don't deliver. So these have to be people who really understand the world of digital, what Epic can and can't do, what's happening in the startup universe. You know, we're a little bit advantaged by being in Silicon Valley, so we see it early. Uh, what Apple's doing, what Google's doing, and then sort of weave it together. It's just not going to happen unless you have a group of people for whom that is their job. Great. We're about to uh, undergo a conversion from Cerner to Epic in the Emory Health System, uh, which is, will be an interesting, uh, uh, God interesting bless you. transition. Yes, I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I, you know, we, we we made a choice to go with Epic about eight years ago, and I think it's the it, it is the right choice. I think it's yeah, and yeah. particularly in California, where essentially every big system has Epic, there are advantages to everybody being on the same platform. But good luck to you. We are at the hour, but if I could slide in one question that a few people asked in different ways uh, for a quick answer, um, which is very germane sort of to our practice here. Um, what do you think the role of healthcare organizations is in ensuring patients have access to digital platforms? And you know, our, our concern is always about the digital divide and achieving health equity with more with patients who are more vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it's actually exciting that this is happening now, where people are thinking about that, and it's front of mind. I think ten years ago, I, I think folks wouldn't have given this a whole lot of thought, and it would have, you know, almost inevitably led to a worsening of the digital divide. Uh, worsening of, of equity problems. I, you know, in high school debating team, I would have been equally comfortable taking the point of view this is going to worsen equity and the point of view this is going to improve equity. My bias is that it's going to improve equity because the once we figure out the economic, to get back to your first question, Wendy, once we figure out the economic model to put a system at risk for the cost of care, it now is in our interest or Medicare's interest, whoever carries the, you know, the, the, has the checkbook to say, you know, it is worth it to have this patient have access to digital tools that will keep them out of the emergency department or out of the hospital, which is costing $10,000 a day. And so giving them access to the digital tools that will allow them to do that is so much more cost effective. Uh, now, are we going to put internet into their houses? I don't know. I suspect that will be a federal initiative. I, I won't be surprised if that's sort of, whether this administration or the next one says, we, this, we have to do this to enable digital care for everybody and digital everything else. But what I am seeing in Silicon Valley is the kinds of third party tools that I saw five years ago, which were, you know, you take them out of the box and you really had to read the instructions to figure out how to use it. And there's just no way someone who's not super computer literate is going to be able to do that. Every company that I talk to now, the tools that they're building are you take it out of the box and you press the green button and it's that's it. it and, and that is a deep understanding that it can't be that you need to understand program language in order to use the digital tools. So I think it's going to be better. And I think also we're all going to be measured and, and held accountable for health equity. And so that's going to sort of keep it front of mind for us as well. So I'm actually pretty enthusiastic about it, but we've got to be very careful about it. Well, so you've outlined a pretty exciting um, next 
couple decades here for us. So thank you very much. I really, again, appreciate so much your willingness to spend this hour with us um, and to give us a glimpse into your vision of the future, which uh, I hope is, is, is true. Um, but so thank you. Thank you. It's a joy and I look forward to seeing you all in person. Great.